911. This is Cook County with a fire transfer. Ma'am, you're on the line. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, there's somebody's garage is going down on Dora and Dickens. Dora and Dickens? Okay, yes. we'll get the fire department out. Biden Fire Department, still alarm reported garage fire on the corner of Dickens and Dora. 807, 817, 911, and Franken Park, you are due. We were out on a three lane by three lane road, and as we approached an intersection, we met with another fire department that was responding to it. The engines collided. Look, um, 901 emergency traffic, North. 901, go ahead with the emergency traffic. 87, 911 has been in a collision. 911 is on its side. Uh, mine spun around so it was facing back toward me and then tipped over onto its side. The crew cab has been uh, completely demolished, compromised by collision with something. During that initial impact, our acting officer, Jeff Bergstrom, was ejected through the front windshield of the cab, uh, landed on the road. Uh, it was relatively immediately known that he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. That seatbelt probably would have saved Jeff's life. His seat on the engine uh, appears to be a completely survivable spot. The seat's intact, the uh, seat belt's intact. Um, there's not a lot of uh, intrusion to that side. It was the opposite side of the cab that took the impact. The forces were not as great over there or anything else. So it, personally, I believe it was a survivable area of the engine. We just think, what could we have done to prevent that? When you see something like that happen and it affects you, um, that personally, it's it's difficult to ignore. This is Northcott Division 20 with a special announcement. Stone Park Fire Department regrets to inform all members. Jeffrey C. Bergstrom has answered his final alarm on April 27, 2004. Alarm number 04-0486. May you rest in peace. Northcott is clear. Case H-539. We're out there to save lives and we have to save our own first so we can help that other person. So we've had a culture of just downright being reckless. You know, we didn't wear our seat belts, we didn't wear our air packs, we didn't monitor air. We, we are just growing accustomed to not taking the steps to keep ourselves safe. Even though it, it was a policy of our department to wear seat belts, um, none of the firefighters, uh, chiefs, really, virtually almost everyone really didn't wear a seatbelt. Maybe occasionally a driver would wear a seatbelt, um, but typically nobody would wear a seatbelt. Any kind of um, thing that kind of goes along with a firehouse, it's like, you know, the, the bravery, and you've got to go get them, you've got to go save them and be the hero. And I don't think someone who doesn't buckle up is a hero. February 18, 2009, my wife and I were home from winter break. Uh, it was approximately like around 10, 10, 15 that evening. Routine call went out for a traffic accident. Roads were very slippery, very wet, snowy, ice, icy conditions. Um, told my wife, my son, who I was giving him a bath, I told him I'd be home shortly, you know, real quick. Off I went. I can definitely tell you it was the last time that I saw my husband. There was no need for the fire department from the police on the scene, so I responded from lights and sirens, code three, to a code two response, no light sirens, to verify. And that's the last I remember after that. I had tra traumatic brain injury, and the four key points of my injury was memory loss, emotions, equilibrium and speech. He's here and I hug him every day, but he's, he's not the same person. It's been a very difficult two years. At home, I know things are not what they used to be. It really affected and it, is, it still is affecting um, the lifestyle at home just because I'm not who I was prior to the accident. The turmoil and the impact it's had on our family has, um, you could closely relate it to mourning someone's death. 
it was a funeral without a casket. It really was. I mean, I, I still look at him today and think, where did he go, you know? And it's all over a seatbelt, which is devastating. So after the accident and the whole culture has changed, we signed the seatbelt pledge and now everybody wears a seatbelt. You have a loved one at home. Uh, it's not so much about you, it's about everybody around you. Come home from your, for your kids, your spouse, your parents. Um, honestly, just please be safe. Please take care of yourself for yourself first and foremost and then for your family. We can talk about our fellow crew members. We can talk about personal accountability. You know, we can put a lot of reasons why we should do it, but at the end of the day, you know, it's your family that wants you to come home more than anybody. We owe them, at the very least, everything that we can do to protect ourselves. And right now, we're not doing that. Because he didn't buckle up, his injury will forever impact his life and the life of his family. None of this will ever go away. And you don't want your family to go through this. You really don't. It's, it's terrible. Wearing a seatbelt for a firefighter is the most important thing he could do to save a life, his own and probably the person we're going to help. If you're a fireman, wear your seatbelt. So the program is more than just seatbelt use. It's about taking personal accountability for yourself. It's about accountability for your fellow firefighters. It's doing more than just wearing your seatbelt. It's looking at all 16 firefighter life safety initiatives. It's taking a courage to be safe class. It's doing whatever steps are necessary and holding yourself accountable to make sure that everyone goes home.